Salutations to the Truth Core, whoever and wherever you may be on the planet. I'm here once again with the second episode of Gnostic Sabotage. So this talk is indicated GS2, and the title is How to Compute the Number of the Beast. To begin, I'll reiterate briefly two of the key points that I'm developing in this short series of talks. First point is that Tomegatherion in Greek means the great beast. And the beast is something that is alive. It's an animal. An elephant is a beast. A living creature is a beast. A wasp can be quite a beast. A human being can also be a beast. Sometimes it's used as in affectionate terms. Oh, you have such a beast. A loving term. Those of you who listen to my talks will know that I frequently use the term human animal, which I prefer to human being. I do this simply to be more accurate. Humans are animals. We are a certain kind of animal. We are an exceptional species of animal compared to horses and dogs, giraffes, llamas, and caribou. But we are animals nonetheless. And I do insist on using that language. It's not a derogatory language. Unfortunately, in current speech, to call someone an animal or say he treated them like an animal uh, is derogatory, but it doesn't necessarily have to be so. And in my jargon, it certainly is not so. The Greek word therion can be found in the word theriomorphic, which means taking the form of an animal. So for instance, when you look at pictures of certain Egyptian deities, you see a man or woman standing in profile, typical of Egyptian art, and then you see that that human form has the head of an animal, such as the jackal, Anubis, or even a crocodile, or a beetle, and those Pictures look very bizarre, but bear in mind that do not rep they do not represent a hybrid between a human and an animal. They represent a member of the Egyptian priesthood wearing a mask and headdress of an animal to represent the cult in which they operate. You see, the Egyptians had many theriomorphic cults. Also, you can use the same expression in reference to the great animal mother, the earth. The notion of, quote, animal powers, unquote, is common in the field of mythology and folklore. So, for instance, in the Native American tradition and in other uh, so-called primitive societies around the world, indigenous societies, the great spirit of the wilderness, the great spirit of nature, who is none other than your earth mother herself, and it must be true because it rhymes, assumes epiphanies. She reveals herself in animal forms, and these are the animal powers of the great goddess. They are the theriomorphic revelations of the earth mother. So my first point is that AI, artificial intelligence, which is a misnomer, and IT, informational technology, that is to say computer technology, founded by Claude Shannon and Norbert Weiner, cannot be a beast. AI is not alive. This computer, this Mac, Book Pro, on which I'm recording, is not alive, and no 
instrument or device or human replica developed with AI and possessed of AI can ever be an animal. It will never have animal properties. So there is a clear and firm boundary between animal and virtual, between organic and inorganic. And so it is entirely wrong to assume that the great beast could be inorganic or as the Gnostics would say, archontic in its structure, in its form, and in its functions. Second point that I'm making, and you'll see how it develops as I proceed, is a bizarre claim. I'm certain, to my knowledge, inform me if I'm wrong, no one else has ever made such a claim. As I said before in the first talk, this claim comes out of a discovery I made at the end of 2012. So that would be what, nine years ago. And I've had nine years to live with it. I have done a series of talks on Gnostic sabotage, which are due to be released on Nemeta sooner or later. But I've had nine years to look at what I'm telling you now and to evaluate it and assess it and criticize it, debunk it, deconstruct it. And I can assure you it holds up, in my mind at least, quite well. So the bizarre claim I'm making is that when you look at the text and the composition of the book of Revelation, there is something in it that is anomalous. There is something in it that actually shouldn't be there or wouldn't be there if the apocalypse of the Christian Bible was purely a derivation of Jewish apocalyptic literature, as most scholars maintain. So, to put it fast and simple, someone came along when that text was being composed and written, probably around the first or second century of our era, and in some way rigged the text. They rigged the narrative. In doing so, they succeeded in sabotaging the narrative. So that's quite a claim to make, I realize. But I stand by my view going on 10 years now that when you detect the Gnostic sabotage, in the book of Revelation, it shows you something that can entirely blow up in the face of those Christians who put their faith in biblical prophecy. And many others as well who are not Christians, because as you may know, there are countless numbers of arguments that identify the great beast of the apocalypse with AI and transhumanist technology, according, uh, including the technology of track and trace, surveillance, barcodes, and now we finally reach the point of the injection of a genetic code. Is that the mark of the beast? Well, let's continue. In these first two talks, I'm concentrating on two verses in Revelation 17 and 18 of chapter 13. So, I covered verse 17. Now, let's take a look at verse 18. Now, these two verses are arguably the most quoted and most discussed verses in the entire Bible. But do people who interpret these verses actually know what they're talking about? Well, unless they can 
translate and decode what is in these verses with a knowledge of Gnostic sabotage, I submit that they do not know what these verses are actually saying. So, with that warning in mind, let's look at verse 18. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred threescore and six. Now, I'm looking closely at the Greek, English, interlinear, and anyone can look at it. It's very easy to find on the internet. Now let's take that s sentence just from the beginning all the way through and look closely at the language used and the specific words that are used. Here is wisdom. Well, the Greek word for wisdom is Sophia. So you could say, this is Sophia. Here comes Sophia. You could translate it in that way, although the Greek is hode he sophia, here is wisdom. In, other, in, in any case, why would the text refer to wisdom? Now, there are passages in the Old Testament that refer to wisdom, not in the colloquial sense of cleverness or knowledge or intelligence, but with direct reference even though veiled and distorted, with direct reference to the wisdom goddess, Sophia. So clues to her presence remain as tiny fragments embedded in the Old Testament. And when you come upon this declarative statement, here is wisdom, well, it's worth considering what is the connotation of the word wisdom in that case? Does it simply mean here is something intelligent, here is something knowledgeable, something you should know, or does it in some way actually allude to Sophia as a divine presence, as the wisdom goddess? It's worth considering. Let him that hath understanding Count the number of the beasts. Okay, let's look at the words, look at the syntax, the way the sentence is composed. Now, Sophia, as I speak of her, is obviously the central figure of the mysteries, the Gnostic mysteries, and so is the word noose. I talk endlessly about noose. Now, noose in Greek simply means, or nous, simply means intelligence. But it is one of the ten key terms in the teachings of the Gnostics. They taught that you have, you and I, human animals, if I may be so bold, have a spark of divine intelligence, nous. You yourself are not divine. You don't have a spark of divinity as an entity. You have a spark of divine intelligence as a living creature. This is the Gnostic nuance. Well, isn't it remarkable that four words, the fourth word after Sophia is noun, knowledge or understanding. Let him that hath noun or noose this is another Gnostic illusion. Someone who would be deeply versed in Gnostic literature and in the teachings coming out of the mystery schools would note immediately the outstanding impact of these two words so close together in this passage. Count the number of the beast. What is the language? There is a Greek verb for to count or count calculate or compute, which is a complex word. And then there is the word 
arithmon, meaning number, and therion, meaning beast. So, arithmon to therion, or theriu, because it's possessive, is the number of the beast. Arithmon. Again, what does this suggest? It suggests, quite literally, doesn't suggest, it directly proposes to do arithmetic on the number of the beast. Do the math. But how do you do the math exactly? So let's continue. For it is the number of a man, and his number is 600, three score, and six. Well, hold on a minute here, deputy dog. If the number at the end of this verse, 666, is the number of a man, what man is it? Who is that man? Well, as a matter of fact, it's not a man at all, because the word for man is anthropos, which is the name in Greek, the term for humanity. It doesn't use the Greek word andros, which is specifically the word that denotes man, the male of the human species. And it doesn't say a man, it says number of the anthropos. Now, have you ever heard that before? That the number of the beast is also the number of the anthropos. Well, how could that be? How could 666 be the number of humanity itself rather than the number of some terrible, monstrous entity threatening humanity? I think you would have to agree if you play along with me, and I don't ask anyone to believe me or accept my views. My interpretation is just that but I am giving you my interpretation with the full basis and background of how I make that interpretation. So you have, as they would say today, in the jargon of the coronavirus psyop, you have now informed choice to decide what you're gonna make of these famous verses. and. I would also point out that the word anthropos is central to the entirety of Gnostic teaching. Scholars talk about the so-called anthropos doctrine. I interpret anthropos as direct denotation of the human genome. That's my particular spin as someone teaching the living Gnosis today. But in either case, if you wanted to list five terms that are used repeatedly in the foundation of Gnosis, three of them would be Sophia, Nous, and Anthropos. And lo and behold, here they are together in the space of a sentence. Now, what are the odds of that? Gnostic sabotage in the book of Revelation. Finally, of course, we come to the number. Again, the word arithmos, there are variations of it, arithmon and arithmos, occurs, and then the designation using the root hex. Now, hex is six. There is a strange game going on with six. I will admit that. And as a matter of fact, a hex means a spell. And hex in Greek literally means six. So could we assume that this number 666 is somehow casting a spell? Or maybe it's inviting you to cast a spell. 
but what kind of spell is it? Now, it's important to look very closely at how this number is indicated. There are three words. The first one is 600. They all begin with hex. And that is hexacosoi, hexacosioi. Hexacosioi is 600. Hexaconta is 60. And hex is 6. But you're not merely given those numbers in the text in the Greek language. The sentences which, in which those numbers appear invites you to do the math, to do the arithmetic. But how do you do the arithmetic? In order to find out what is encoded in these three numbers in this repetition of one single number, in this triple hex. What is in this triple hex? Now listen closely while I say something about the translation as it stands. In these Bible search engines, you can find, I think, up to 20 or 30 different translations of the Old and New Testaments. For convenience, I just go to the so-called King James Version. Now, the King James Version of the translation of the Greek New Testament into English was made several centuries ago, and the diction of the translation reflects the diction and the use of language by people of that time. So, it was common in that time if you referred to a period of time, to say score, three score, four score, three score and 22 years ago, this expression of score, which is what you find in the King James Version, which is the most well-known version. But why would you convert three sixes into three score, 60 and 6, because that is an, a way, that is a calendric notation. So why would you use a calendric notation to translate these numbers, or in fact, to convert them? Is that appropriate? I don't think so. Do the three numbers in some way refer to a passage of time or a period of time? Well, you would think so due to the choice of the translators of the King James Version to use that diction, but I contend that that diction is wrong and misleading. The verse 18 simply ends with those three numbers, six, six, six. But the verse says, calculate those numbers, perform arithmetic on those numbers. Now, if I give you these three numbers, 5, 7, 2, and I ask you to perform arithmetic on those numbers, what are you going to say? Are you going to say 5 score, 70, and 2? Are you going to say 500 plus 70 plus 2? Well, yeah, that's a kind of arithmetic, but... Take note very carefully that if I give you the numbers 5, 7, and 2, and you come back and say 572, you're counting on the placement of those numbers, the decimal placement. So the first number, 5, is in a decimal placement of the third position, which is hundreds. The number 7 is in the second position, which is tens, and the number two is in the first position, which is single digits. But is that the way to convert or compute 666? I say no. I say that the correct way to compute it is obvious. You do the math. Now, what kind of math can you apply to those three numbers? Well, actually, there are several variations, but the first two 
are obvious and they are easy to compute. And the first two come to mind immediately when you look at those three numbers. I emphasize that when you look at those three numbers, 666, six, six, do not place them in a decimal sequence. If you place them in a decimal sequence, then they come out to 666. But the way I'm going to show you to compute them now produces something utterly different. How can you do arithmetic with those three numbers? Well, you can multiply them together. That's one choice. Six times six times six. You see, that's arithmetic. That's what the verse tells you to do. And the result is 216. Now, I can't go into the reasons for this right now, but I can tell you strangely that the number 216 actually has a calendric value. It is the number of years that remain in the great kalpa of 25,920 years, years, which is one day of aeonic time. So, in the year 2000, of our calendar, the Western Christian calendar, at that moment, there were 216 years remaining until the end of that great time cycle. Now, that's another story. That's what's called sacred calendrics. And if I were to go into that, I would have to go off on a huge digression. But I'll just leave you with that sweet little morsel of sacred chronology to chew on. Now we come to the other simple and obvious way to do arithmetic. If you don't multiply the three sixes, then you add them. Six plus six plus six, and that equals 18. And that is the number of the beast, 18. How can I say that? How can I make that claim? Well, now we turn from the code to the image, the icon of the great beast. In order to do that, we go back to chapter 13, and we go from the last verse, which ends with the three numbers, 666, to the first verse, which goes like this. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. Count the number of the beast. Seven and ten is seventeen. Oops, doesn't match, does it? Looks like my skill in arithmetic is not so good. But just hang on for a moment, my friends. Remember, we've been looking at chapter 13, and we come up with the number 17, which is the composition of the parts of the great beast. It has seven heads and ten horns. Where is the 18th factor? Well, we go from the beast composed of 17 parts to the 17th chapter. How convenient is that? And in that chapter it says, Come here, little one, and I will show unto thee the judgment of the great harlot that sitteth upon many waters. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, having seven heads and ten horns. And there it is, the full 18. You see, 
This beast of the apocalypse is quite a complex monster. It has 18 parts, seven heads, 10 horns, and a rider, a female figure, dressed in scarlet, rides on the scarlet beast. The scarlet woman is 18. And that is the secret identity concealed in Gnostic sabotage in the book of Revelation. Nuff said, and I'll be seeing you in the beauty to come.